So um, welcome back for the last session of uh, day one in this DHS2 annual conference in Asia Pacific region. So we have two more countries uh, yet to present for the day one. So uh, may I invite uh, the Ministry of Health, Maldives, Ms. Sharma, uh, who is present here. There's, there's been a lot of progress in implementing DHS2 in Maldives over a very short span of time, and we are really excited to hear. So please uh, come and present your uh, all, the, all the interesting stories. Um, Assalamu alaikum and a very good evening. Uh, so just to begin off after the tea break, we are going to look into DHS2 implementation in Maldives. So just to begin to give a little bit of uh, background on what uh, which country Maldives is, we are actually a very small country in contrast to most of the countries here. We are very small in uh, scale. So we have a population of only about 560,000 people, and this includes around 300,000 Maldivians. So we have a mix of foreigners and locals living in our country. So Maldives is what you will know as an archipelago, like we are made of a, a lot of islands, and then we are distributed into different administrative, uh, what we call as atolls. So the equivalent of atolls in other countries would be districts. So whenever I talk about an atoll, I'm talking about a district. So we have about 186 inhabited islands and our health system is based on tertiary facilities and a mix of uh, uh, public hospitals and private facilities, including clinics as well. So to begin, our journey with DHS2 actually began, became, be, began very recently in 2019, just a few months shy of COVID-19. So the first time we implemented DHIS2 was to find a solution to get timely reporting of the aggregate data that is being reported to ministry. So these are what we call as the monthly statistical reports. I think a practice which is done in many countries where you ask the health facilities to report to them about their outpatient statistics, inpatient statistics, how many surgeries they did, how many laboratory and diagnostic, tests that did they run, how many, uh, what is their health uh, workforce, and also what is the bed count. So these are the things we actually wanted to get. It was being practiced in Maldives, but uh, at that time, it was very Excel-based, and it's very hard, especially a country like Maldives, which is very distributed, and we are at the center, and then asking people to you know report to us. So we thought maybe we should change it. We should try to utilize DHIS2 so that at facility level, the reporting can happen. And at the central level, we can do the, uh, we can just monitor how much they are doing it. And the beauty of doing that is now we know places which are doing pretty well. There are atolls which are at 100% reporting rate. And we have two colleagues today with us, uh, Zlifa and Suma. They are from two districts, which has 100% timely reporting. And that's the reason why they have been invited to participate in this conference uh, from all this side as well. The, the data that we generate from DHS2 based on this aggregate is linked with our statistical output. The main statistical report that in Maldives is called Maldives Health Statistics. And the book that you see there, majority of the data uh, chapters are based on the data we get out of the DHS2 implementation. And I will just show you an example of how we try to utilize the data visualization aspect of DHIS2 to facilitate or make the process easier for the staff who are, uh, who are involved with the uh, data compilation and the report writing of our statistical series. So this uh, graph shows exactly how it will appear in our next 2021 statistical report of the distribution of health professionals. So in Maldives, we like to group the health workforce into nurses, non-medical staff, doctors, allied health professionals, and other staff. But in reality, when we collect data, it's more granular in nature. We have 42 data elements in DHIS2 that people enter data into. But at the statistical report, we don't want to write everything you know, at the granular level. We need to have a way that policymakers or the public, a layman, can understand and utilize that data. So one thing we did was we are going to make our process easier for the staff by ensuring that uh, we will do the categorizations in DHS to in a way they can automize and generate these kind of tables. So in this one, if you look at the legend, we, we do exactly the same as uh, the state book. We have allied health professionals, doctors, non-medical staff, nurses, other staff. So no other manual regrouping has to be done by the staff at the end of the day. 
And we also thought maybe we are doing at facility level, the most lowest level, we are collecting data. So there is option for us to utilize the same data in different formats. Like we have the National Spatial Plane where we categorize more of these into regions. We have three regions. So in DHS to itself automatically, once they feed the data at the health facility level, we can generate an output like this where we see uh, the distribution uh, in regions. And at a glance, we can really easily see the most of the health workforce is based on region two, which is central. And it makes sense because the greater Mala region, the capital city region is based in central. So most of the tertiary facilities are there as well. But we can also go deeper as well, because we again thought ownership is important as well. There are private facilities, public facilities, and there are joint partnership facilities as well. So we can look at human resource through DHS to again with the way that we have categorized them uh, into public, private, and government facilities as well. So in that way, like we know in public sector, there is a lot of uh, human resource there, but we see that the you know, HR uh, doctors are still a little bit lower in terms. And we can also again look into local expatriate as well. So now we can see exactly where our local capacity in human resource needs to be filled. Because if you look at the locals, what we see is that the blue one is the doctors. There are more expatriate doctors compared to local doctors. Again, giving us information that can assist in uh, future human resource capacity building work, works or things that is happening. So this is just one example of how we started our journey with an aggregate module. And then we thought there is also potential for us to go into more, uh, more into individual based information as well. Because we are a small country, we should leverage what we can do as well. And also, we already had people being trained. COVID happened, people were used to uh, entering data into systems. So it was the high time we try something to solve an issue that is already at the ground level. The problem with MODIS is that most of the births happen in the central level where they give, uh, oh, sorry, I have five minutes remaining. The problem of Maurice is that uh, most of the birth happens in the center, but they will go back to their islands and they will continue the ne next dose. There are two vaccines that is given at birth, Hep B and BCG. But when they go back to another island to continue, that facility does not know whether they have been given vaccinations at the center because they will not be monitored unless and otherwise they carry their manual uh, child health record book. So this is an issue the facilities were dealing with and they were they really wanted a solution where we can track the vaccinations across multiple facilities. And that's how the concept of the electronic immunization registry came in place. And we rolled it out in October, 2020. So only one year since we rolled out. So what's the progress so far? More this is very small. So our, our births are also very small, but if you look at the figure 5,293, that is the number of uh, children who are registered this year and their uh, births are, or, or their vaccinations are already being updated on a regular basis. That is 96% of our live births, including the births that had been reported from abroad as well. And that's a very, we are very proud to say as a collective effort that we have been doing, it's a pretty good achievement. We still have 4% to capture, hopefully inshallah we will do that. And we started in October last year, all, all, already 10 months has been passed, but uh, at present we have 86% of last year births already in the system and the vaccination records also up to date as well. All right, so I'll go to the next thing we did. So very recently we rolled, uh, rolled out what we call as the primary healthcare registry, which is based on uh, screening for non-communicable diseases. They're, according to the package of essential non-communicable diseases, there are particular NCDs that we have to closely monitor. So the, the beauty of this uh, uh, registry is that we calculate a risk score based on hearts package for people aged 40 years and above. And we also have a locally adapted risk score for people aged 18 years and above. So at the moment, 18 years and above is who, the, uh, the group that we are targeting. So this is an, uh, some statistics we get from the one at all or district in Maldives called Faf at all, where the primary healthcare demonstration is happening. So it's a very important site. 
So based on the uh, information we have, 94% of all the eligible people living in the atoll is already empaneled. And among them, 97, close to 98% of them has done the initial screening. So the idea behind the primary health care registry is to keep our community healthy by uh, having a more active role by the health facilities, because we are the people who has the knowledge to guide people. So why should we wait until a person gets sick and they come? But what if we actively engage with them? So that's the whole concept behind this. So once we filter the whole population, we identify the high risk people. So if you look at the remaining, the smaller graph, initially when we rolled out in March, we had to focus a lot on enrollment, enrollment, and initial screening. But as the days went by, the focus is more on follow-ups. The red bars are the follow-ups because they are already there and we are only focused on screening the high-risk people now. And what we have identified is that um, based on this, we can really uh, drill down again into different diseases. Like this one is showing the diabetes. And from the graph, we are, we are able to see that the red one, there are 10 people in this island who are diabetic, diagnosed to be diabetic, but not on treatment. Why? And also there are 96 people who are saying who are on treatment, but they are still not controlled. So this 96 plus 10, this is the group that they are planning to uh, make changes because their behavior has to be changed or the concept of uh, a disease is beyond uh, uh, just curing based on their biological issues, but the social determinants of health plays a role in when a person has. So the whole concept behind this primary health care is to think beyond just clinical care, think about their health, ways to promote their health and continue to keep them healthy. All right, so the next one that we have is the National Cancer Registry. And this is also something we are doing very recently. I have only like one, well, less than one minute remaining. Uh, so the National Cancer Registry is based on CanReg and we have recently rolled it out as well. And this is also providing a lot of information, even with one facility that is currently implementing this, we see that uh, there are more females who has diseases and the breast cancer is one of the leading ones that we face as well. Um, there are so many things that we are doing at the background uh, to ensure compliance, to ensure that the data entry users are really involved with us. That is like providing really good user support as well. So I think uh, given the time I'm gonna stop here, <laughs> But maybe if you're interested, maybe I'll touch on the training parts and the user support parts later on as well. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Now, this is a challenge, right? When you have too many exciting stuff, new stuff, there is no time, not enough time to present. So we have time just for one question. Only one, yes. it's only one question i will make it a uh, big thank you for the for the team on the new work and uh, uh, it's not a question just it's a reflection quick reflection about utilizing the dhis2 to be like a public health intervention tool rather than capture and really the, this is a smart design and a smart application of public health interventions by using the dhis2 rather than capturing the uh, routine statistics. And this is part of the data utilization and data use. It's not only just to present the data and to visualize the data. So what you presented recently, this is the applied public health science. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yes, actually that's the thing that we are promoting in more this context. So the concept of health, healthy life expectancy, health. So there's a difference between life expectancy and health. So in Maldives, we have a very high life expectancy now, which is close to 80. But when people be become bedridden at the age of 50 years or 60 years, we are losing a lot of quality adjusted life years. So a project like a, something like this, primary healthcare, most of the time what we know is people with lower health seeking behaviors are the people who will uh, have a, a negative health outcome as well. So the 10 people that is not taking the medication and the 96 people who are saying they're taking medication, but they, they are not improving. Potentially, these are the people whose diabetes situation will continue to aggravate. So the tertiary prevention side will be really uh, affected by that as well. So that's the reason why we, we are really uh, working on this primary health care registry.
I thank you so much. I know like there are so many questions uh, from all this. Please, uh, yeah, you can meet her during the breaks and even tonight. Uh, I, I will tell more about what will be happening tonight before we all leave. But before that, we have one more, one final uh, presentation, uh, country presentation for the day. So Ministry of Health uh, Indonesia, yes, please. Okay, good evening. Uh, good, yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, I will present the HIS2 implementation in Indonesia. Yeah, uh, here's the, the, the HIS2 rollout over the years in Indonesia. I, I, I think it's just, let's say, um, just the, sa the same with another countries that uh, around 2012 and 2013, Yon came to every country to introduce the HIS2. <laughs> I see uh, another presentation also the same. Yeah, so in Indonesia, there are two types of implementation of the HIS2. Uh, we divide it in national scale and sub-national sub scale. This is the implementation of the HIS2 in national uh, level. Uh, we call it ASDK, Aplikasi Satu Data Kesehatan, or One Health Data Application. In this application, we provide monitoring and data quality assurance. Uh, we use uh, uh, variables of completeness, consistency time, consistency data, and outliers for the priority indicators. Uh, in this application, we the data collection uh, we made uh, by API, and it's uh, covering 61 priority indicators of health programs. Uh, we're collecting more than 700 data elements. And we also already provide video tutorial that get user using the HIS2 properly. And there is an issue uh, in this uh, implementation of ASDK. There are too many metadata that not using as essential need to be need to be cleaning. And we found that sometimes there are data differences from uh, data BigQuery to uh, ASDK. This is the flow of data transfer in ASDK. Uh, so the data from the existing health information uh, goes to the National Data Warehouse or BigQuery and then goes to the HIS2. In the HIS2, uh, use as a dashboard analysis and data quality assessment. Uh, another uh, implementation in national level also, we use the, the HIS2 in uh, malaria system information. And there will be an, uh, another ongoing implementation for MNCH dashboard and analysis. And uh, this is the implementation of the HIS2 in sub-national level. Uh, we, we use in uh, several districts, like in Maros, Denpasar, uh, Makassar, NTB, the tower housing uh, from Jakarta, and Kulon Progo. We use also the HIS2 in support education and digital laboratories in uh, undergraduate and postgraduate program in one uh, university. And this is the problems, not problems, actually, challenges that we found in implementation of the HIS2. The first challenges uh, is that now we use the HIS2 for uh, data quality assessment. So uh, the challenges in that implementation first, the WHO quality, the key quality tools app on the HIS2 needs to be updated to suit the HIS2 version. After the HIS2 has been updated to version uh, 2.4, the WHO DKA tool app cannot uh, be set. The second, we use WHO data quality tools to assess several parameters of routine health data. Unfortunately, when the, the HIS2 updated to latest stable version, the, the, the WHO data quality apps cannot be used there was some versioning issues on the apps. The three uh, challenges, uh, second step of the DKI data is verification to the health facility. Uh, in here, in the field, we compare data from health facility to the, to the data that has been reported to higher level. And the, the result of uh, verification is verification factor. And we ask uh, to uh, developer of uh, the HIS2 to facilitate this step because now, not, now it's not facilitated yet. Uh, 
for the lenders, data entry is needed for system monitoring evaluation in DKA tools. But to be able to use it, the user must be a super user. So this is a problem for us because all these things we have given them as a super user. So it's ridiculous. Five, we also need to upload supported document for the system monitoring assessment. Also, we need support for this. This is another, uh, I have, I have, I bring here too many problems, sorry. Another, uh, how to manage different instances to keep up with standard. Second, update the HIS2 at each national and subnational level instance every six months, release the latest version of the HIS2 since we implement it in uh, separate instances. We need also uh, interoperability of, in uh, this is also uh, several problems we found, interoperability of individual service data with fire standards to Satu Sehat. We, ha we have application name Satu Sehat. So we need uh, how to connect individual data that already use the HIS2 connected to the Satu Sehat application. We found problem in this also. And there's uh, application usage requires adapting to the latest DHIS2 version, such as the uh, WHO data quality tools. This is another challenge, I'm sorry. Uh, then another challenge is we have limited resources in supervising the HIS2 implementation, including the DKA rollout. Uh, there are there is also a technology constraint. Yeah, some features in the HIS2, such as WHO quality tools, might no longer under maintenance. But this morning we talked to Austin. Uh, Os Oslo University will do something to it. And yeah, no obligation to you. In Indonesia, there is no obligation to utilita, utilize the HIS2, including uh, conducting the key through the HIS2. Uh, for that, we have future initiative that we want to develop national regulation to enhance the use of the HIS2, particular for the, the, the key. We also want to expanding the HIS2 uh, for DKA focus from province to health facility level and creating a DKA high quality dashboard within the HIS2 platform. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I, I especially like those challenges part. So there were some concrete issues that she has highlighted. I think some of these were also raised uh, during the internal workshop we had uh, two days back. Uh, okay, so I think uh, how much time we have? Probably we definitely have time for questions. Two questions, that's all. Any questions or comments for Indonesia? So I think all of you heard what Ola said. So there will be a separate session on that. So I encourage all of you, please attend that session. And we'd really like it if uh, we can maintain the sessions very interactive. So it's been really good so far. Uh, the country presentations today have been very engaging. We want uh, the next two days also uh, to maintain the same momentum. Any more questions? No? Right, I think you all are a bit too tired probably. So uh, we are coming to towards the end of the day, but of course we have one more session. So, um, yeah. So uh, let me explain what will happen next. So we have now one more session where uh, we will have breakout. So we will have the session on data governance, which will be happening and uh, at this venue, the Grand Crystal Ballroom. And then the next session, which will happen at the same time is on toolkit implementation, which will be at the Gregory Hall. So that hall is downstairs on the same complex, right? So uh, those are the two sessions pending for the day. What I encourage you to do, decide like what is the session you like more, uh, whether you want to be on data governance session or to toolkit imp implementation sessions. So if it is the toolkit implementation, you need to go to the hall, the Gregory Hall, which is downstairs, right? But before you leave, I have some announcements related to logistics. So today, 
evening we are having the gala dinner so the dinner will be happening at cinnamon lakeside hotel so it's a different hotel which is uh, located about around 1.5 2 kilometers from here so you can of course wa walk but uh, we have arranged transport for all of you okay so what we are requesting you to do is to be at the taj samudra hotel lobby at 6:30 pm right so we have arranged transport so there are some vans which will be leaving at 6:30 right because we only have four to five vans we will not be able to accommodate all of you at one go so they will be coming back and uh, collecting the remaining participants uh, because the thing is uh, it's a different venue so uh, the the dinner will be held on a boat right so uh, and it will be sailing yes it will be sailing for two hours uh, so we really want all of you to be in that uh, cinnamon lakeside hotel by 7 pm so we kindly request all of you to be at the uh, with the uh, at the Taj Samudra lobby at 6:30 p.m. sharp. One final announcement. Uh, again, like uh, those of you who have not collected your conference pack package, please uh, go to the registration desk. So your conference package is there, and there are some very useful uh, items which will come really handy, uh, especially with uh, during this rainy weather in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, anything else, Arab? Right. Thank you so much. It's not. Uh, we, we are not done for the day. So please, uh, the governance people who are participating for the governance session, stay here. The toolkit implementations downstairs. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. No problem. It's okay. It's okay.